Good morning, St. Mark. Boy, I'm, I'm excited that you're here this morning. I, I want to ask you to believe something with me that Jesus taught us that where two or three come together in his name, there he is with them. And I want you to believe with me that Jesus is here with us today, invisibly, to comfort us, to instruct us, to guide us, and that he's going to move in your life this morning. I want to invite you to this worship service. You can find everything you need in the bulletin or up on the screen. And we're going to begin with an opening hymn that invites you to come to Jesus no matter who you are. Please sing as you feel comfortable. Please stand. We're going to think a lot about baptism today, especially Jesus talks about it. I want to start the service like that as we begin with the words you were baptized. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful in that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today comes from Genesis chapter 12. Here we see Abram called to the new life of faith. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. 
From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson comes from Romans chapter 4. And here the Apostle Paul teaches us that the new life of faith justifies. What then shall we say to Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead, and calls into being things that were not. The word of the Lord. This time, uh, we're going to join singing the the sermon hymn. I think that some of you are going to notice, at least I hope you notice, that this is uh, an interpretation of John 3.16 and a good way to start thinking about John chapter 3, which we're about to look at together.
please stand out of respect for the words and the works of Christ. What a treat to be able to take you today through John chapter 3. Here's Christ's great teaching. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling, ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water in the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. There are different ways to move into John chapter 3. I figure that probably about 80% of you know the obvious one. Just let the rest of John chapter 3 fall away and do John 3.16. And that's valid. I think that's valid. I considered it for a while. I even read an entire book just to consider it. There's a book that a guy named Max Lucado wrote. It's called The Numbers of Hope 316. And I read the whole book just to consider how it might be appropriate for us to do that here at St. Mark. Just hone in on John 316, but I couldn't do it. Call it pastoral intuition, call it the guiding of the Holy Spirit in my heart, call it whatever you want, I couldn't do it. I think that part of it is because I'm very personally drawn to the words of Christ. And John 3.16 almost certainly is not the words of Christ. Christ. Now, I know I have a red-letter Bible, too. A red-letter Bible is one of those Bibles that has the words of Christ supposedly in red. And in my Bible, John 3.16 is red. In my Bible, the editors think that John 3.16 is actually the words of Christ. Almost certainly it's wrong. Jesus doesn't call God God. He calls God Father. And John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, not the Father so loved the world. And John does, Jesus does not refer to himself as God's one and only Son. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Who calls God God and who calls, God, calls Jesus God's one and only Son? That's John. 
John 3.16 is almost certainly the words of John. And so one of the reasons why I didn't want to just do a sermon on John 3.16 is because personally I'm drawn to the words of Christ. But the bigger picture is this. Jesus does a teaching here that deeply, deeply matters. Because what he does here is he teaches on being born again. And that matters no matter who you are here. You might not be a Christian, and you know it. Do you know what this teaching can do for you? It can make you into a Christian has that kind of power. There's a second group of people here. You, here's the second group of people. You might think you're a Christian, but you're not. Jesus shocked us when he said this category can exist. He, he even used the, word, used the word many to describe how many people are like this. You're a Christian, but you think you're a Christian, but you're actually not. You pray, you do good works, you do it in Jesus' name, but you think you're a Christian, you're actually not a Christian. This, this teaching is for you because this teaching not only has the power to reveal that fact to you, but also change that in you. But then there's a final group of people in here. You're actually Christians. If you're actually Christian, this is also for you. Why is it for you? Why is this teaching on being born again for you? I'll tell you why. One of the greatest theologians who ever lived, a guy by the name of Martin Chemnitz, he said this. He says, by God's grace, he says, I have been born again. But this is the, then this is what he said. It's only begun, and it's growing throughout my earthly life. So if you've already been born again, if you're already a Christian, what this teaching does is it helps you be, you've just been born. Now you can turn from a baby into a woman. Turn from a baby into a man. You can grow. So you can grow. So this is for everybody in here. This teaching on being born again. And here's how we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it like this. First of all, we're going to look at the necessity of being a born again. Then we're going to look at what it is, its essence. And then finally, we're going to look at how do I get it? What's the means? It's necessity. Then it's essence. And then finally, it's means. How do we get it? First of all, Look at what Jesus says here. He says it's, ne it's a necessity. He says in Nicodemus, you're not going to see the kingdom of God, heaven, you're not going to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You've got to be born again. It's, you must. See, it's you must. You must be born again. Now, <laughs> it's possible that you in your head have a cat, you, you have an idea of what it means to be born again. And it might not quite be right. Because, because in America today, we have an idea. We have an idea of what it means to be born again. In America today, we think this is what it means to be born again. You have some kind of emotional, cathartic experience. You, 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 all of a sudden, there's some kind of massive moral change in your life. This is what we think of being born again. I was, I was, I was addicted to something, and now I'm not. I was sleeping around, and then I stopped. <laughs> See? You have this cathartic experience. You have this massive moral change. That's not exactly what Jesus was talking about here. Look at who he's talking to. He's talking to Nicodemus. Who is Nicodemus? What does John say? Well, he was a Pharisee and a member of the ruling council, which is kind of like being a pastor and a senator in one. He was a moral paragon. He was top brass. He was, he was a pastor and a senator in one. He had his life together. And then look at him. He comes to Jesus. Look at him. He's a, this is a good man. This is a good, he, right? On, on the surface, he's a good man. He comes to Jesus. He's not like the other Pharisees. The other Pharisees are trying to tear Jesus apart. He comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I want to talk to you. And he does it with great respect. He says, teacher. And then... 
In addition to that, um, he, says, he says, Jesus, he treats him with such respect. He says, Jesus, he's rational, right? He's, he says, Jesus, you're doing all these miraculous signs. You must be from God. So he's, he's rational, he's, he's respectful, he's different than the other Pharisees, and yet Jesus says to him, that's not enough, you've got to be born again. Nicodemus, you have to be. Here he is, he's a moral, moral, paragon, moral pa- paragon. He's a pastor and a senator. Jesus says, you have to be born again. What a shock. It should be a shock. He doesn't need a moral change. He doesn't, he, he doesn't need some emotional experience. Here's a guy, here's a guy, I guarantee you, this guy went to church every single week, didn't miss. Jesus says, you gotta be born again. This is a man, he would receive the Old Testament sacrament of baptism, the equivalent, he, the guy had been effectively baptized in a certain sense, he, he, had, he had been circumcised. Nicodemus, you got to be born again. He, he, he taught the church's truths. He defended the church's truths. He was Israel's teacher. He taught the Bible. He held to the Bible. Jesus said, not enough. You have to be born again. That's a shock. Actually, it should be a shock. It should be a shock to us today. Do you know what? Here's a concern. I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow right now. The great Lutheran preacher and professor C.F.W. Walther, I want you to be shocked. This is what he said. This is what he thought about when he thought about these verses. He had a concern that there would be people in the church who thought that they were baptized and then they were good to go. people might even look at John 3 and they say, look, Jesus says you got to be baptized. That's exactly what Jesus said. You got to be baptized. But Jesus said it's water and the spirit. There's a, there's, a, there's a deeper concern here. See, if you think you're baptized and you're good to go, you're not getting it yet. In fact, our church has said historically that people who have this, foot, this view, you're baptized, you're good to go, that's, that, that's an ancient heresy. They said that's a false belief where you believe that baptism works opera ex operato. You don't have to remember the Latin, it's fine. I'm just telling you, it's really, really old, hundreds of years old. We've always said that, that if you think you're baptized and you're good to go, you're not getting it. Because what you need to do, what the new birth is, is that you are actually believing what baptism has done in your life. Baptism is a promise that you are to believe. Let me illustrate this for you. You can listen to sermons. And that is not going to do you a lick of good. You realize that you can listen to sermons and not going to do you a lick of good? Lots of people, lots of people listen to sermons. There's going to be hundreds and thousands of people all over the country listening to sermons, and you know what they do with them? They walk out the door, they hit the sidewalk, and it drops to the ground, and they never think about it again. Listening to a sermon is not going to do you a lick of good. Do you know what does? Do you know what does? Believing them. You can be baptized. Do you know how your baptism does you any good? Believing the gift that baptism gives you in Christ. So, here's what we got. We got a teaching where you got to be born again, and apparently that doesn't mean you clean up your life. And apparently that doesn't mean you need to go to church more. What it means is that the new life of faith exists in your heart. Test yourself for a second. I want to shock yourself for a second. Ask yourself, if Jesus was sitting with you, would he say the same thing to you? Would he say to you, you have got to be born again? See, but, but I was baptized, Jesus. You got to be born again. But I taught Sunday school for like 10 years. You got to be born again. What would Jesus say to you? 
What do you say? See if Doug Walter said you can come to church every Sunday, you can have experiences in the church, you can be baptized. But then he said this, such a person can still be a natural man shut out from God's kingdom unless he has a newborn heart from the Holy Spirit. It is necessary to be born again in the heart. Does that open you now to understanding a little bit better what it is? So what is it? What, it, what, what, is it, what does it actually mean to have a newborn heart? What does it mean to have this new birth inside? What does it mean? I want to talk about this in three ways. I'm mean, using the word radical every single time. What does it mean for you to have a newborn heart? What's, what's its essence in you? First of all, it is radical personally. It's radical personally. Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Jesus is talking about a radical change inside. You become a new person inside. You have a new spirit, a new soul. You have a new psychology at work inside of you. It's radical in your core, personally. So it's not just that you have new behaviors, it's that you have a new motive inside. It's not just that you're doing different things, but you are a totally new person inside. It's radical, personally, but also it's radical, relationally. It's radical, relationally. Jesus used this, Jesus used this metaphor. He said you have to be born again. If you unpack that metaphor, you realize that what's, here's what that means. You get a new parent. You actually get a new parent. Now, I know how birthing goes. I was, I was just there six months ago. I know how this goes. Somebody is born through the blood and the suffering of another. You see? You get a parent that way through the blood and the suffering of another. You get a new parent. It, this is, look, this is radical relationally. You're actually getting a new parent. You know what everybody says about the new birth? Everybody says this. All the theologians say this. Do you know what, you know what they say? When you are born again, what happens is you start, you start to care about God. You actually start to care about your parents. You, you, now, it, it might just be a little birth. You might just be a little baby with it. It might be just a little bit. But you start to care about God. And when you start to care about God, everybody says at, so, at some level, I'm not telling you at what level, I'm telling you at some level, the experience that you have in your heart is that you are sad. That you have been far from God. And then you long for God's mercy. I'm not telling you at what level you have to experience that. I'm saying, I'm saying you care even just a little bit. It might, it, might be just, it might be just a tiny little baby in your heart. Just like a baby's cry. But you care about God. Somehow, you care about God in the least measure. Now, I, before I was trying to shock you just a little, just, to, just like Jesus was rocking Nicodemus' world, I was trying to rock your world just a little bit, but now I want to comfort you. I actually want to comfort you. You ready? Here's some comfort. If you care about God in your heart, even in the least measure, you have been born again. I'm trying to let that settle on your heart. Isn't that comforting? Might be a baby. We might need to grow that up into a full-grown woman, but there it is. You have been born again. You realize you have a parent who's God. You've been born again. This is radical relationally. But then finally, it is radical temporally. 
It's radical in time. This, this was my aha moment for me this week. I was studying the scripture and I realized this is exactly what's going on. This is radical temporally. It's radical in time. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus said to Nicodemus that you, when you're born again, you're going to see the kingdom of God. You're going to see it. You're, you're going to experience it. And, if, and, and Nicodemus would have thought of one thing. When he was thinking about the kingdom of God, he would have thought of one thing. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is, is when God destroys all evil and God raises the dead and all of the bad things are gone and God establishes, see, God establishes a new life of justice and peace and love and it's everywhere and everything's right. This is the, you would have thought of the end of the world. He would have thought of the restoration of all things. Do you realize what Jesus is saying? He's saying when you experience the new birth, here's what's happening. God is pulling forward into the present eternal life. Right in your heart, he is birthing. He's he's making a beginning of eternity. All these, right? A little birth. It might not be everything, but you experience peace and joy and love and hope. He is, God is taking it from eternity. He's pulling it forward. He's birthing it. He's beginning it. Don't you see that? Right there. This is why John 3.16, people, people don't think about this enough, but this is why John 3.16 doesn't say that you will have eternal life. It doesn't say you will have eternal life. What does it say? It says they, that whoever believes has eternal life. Because God is taking a little bit of the perfection that is to come and he's, and he's birthing it in your heart. He's making the peace, the joy, the faith, the hope. All of it, it begins. The rest of the New Testament talks about that in another way. There's a different metaphor for this. And the rest of the New Testament says, says it like this, that the Holy Spirit is given to you as a down payment. It's not the whole house. It's a down payment. It's a beginning. It's a new birth of everything that is, that is going to come. This is radical, temporally. It is just a little, do you see this? It's just a little bit of heaven, the powers of heaven planted in your souls right now, right in your present. Do you know what I think you should do with this? I think you should embrace it. And I think the best way to embrace this is not to belittle it. Do you know what I hear some people saying? It bugs me. Do you know what I hear some people say? They say, this is what they say. They say, I'm just a sinner pastor. It bugs me. And they think, see, I'm just a sinner pastor. And they, and they say that, and they think, this is an honest Christian confession. No, it's not. You are not just a sinner. If you are just a sinner, then you're not a Christian. What you are is a sinner. But you are a whole lot more than a sinner. <laughs> You are someone in whom the new life of faith has taken root. You are somebody with the powers of heaven inside. You're not just a sinner. See, you know, you know what Smokey the Bear says on Twitter? <laughs> Nobody's smiling about that. I thought I'd get a smile at that. Smokey the Bear's on Twitter. Do you know what Smokey the Bear says on Twitter? He says what he always used to say. All it takes is a spark to cause a forest fire. All it takes is a spark, but what we can do is we can blow it into flame. See? None of you are as stuck as you think. Here's a true confession. I used to be an anxious man. I'm serious. I used to be an anxious man. I used to get anxious about everything. 
I don't anymore. Sleep like a baby at night. My twins, six months ago, they were in the hospital for nine days. Do you know what happened? They hooked them up to all these machines, and then the machines would start beeping when they weren't breathing. And I tell people about that, and they'd say, You must have been so anxious. Do you know what? I wasn't. And do you know why? Because I'm such a great man. (laughs) No. Because God had given me trust. And I believed him. Look. I think we're all sinners, and I think that sin is the second greatest power power in this universe. The second greatest power in this universe. (laughs) Did I say the second? What I will not say is that the powers of hell in me are greater than the powers of heaven. You'll never hear me say that. Or that the powers of God are somehow less than the power of sin in my soul. I think what we should do with this is we should embrace it. God has placed so much power in our hearts, nothing less than the power of the new birth and the Holy Spirit. Do you want to know how you can get more of it? What's the means of this? Did you, did you catch? I just made my last turn for today. How do we get more of this? Look, look at this, Nicodemus. Nicodemus is, is like a case study in this. Here's Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He says, he says Jesus, you're, you're my teacher. Je- Jesus, you teach me. And Jesus says, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. You need, to be, you need to be born again. You need to find a whole new way, a whole new way of relating to me and relating to, to my Father. You need to find a whole new way. He said that to Nicodemus. Now, this is, this is where, here we are. We're in the season of Lent. In the season of Lent, we're making turns. We're making turns to God. And, and what I want to do is I actually want to get past the Sunday school version of this. A lot of times what we do is we say, this is what we're going to do in Lent. We're going to turn away from our sins and we're going to turn to God in repentance and faith and we think of all the bad things that we do in our life. We're going to turn from the bad things we do in life and I want to get past the Sunday school version of this. Do you know what sin is? Sin is you wanting what you want and do you realize Do you realize that there are actually two ways of you getting what you want for you? There are two ways, not one. One way is by sinning. One way is by being bad. I want to sleep around. I want to drink too much. I want to cheat on my taxes. I want to do that stuff. So one one of the ways that you can try to get what you want is you try to be bad. But there's another way of you getting what you want. Do you know what it is? By being good. By being good. You stop sleeping around because you want to have a stable relationship. You stop drinking because you know it's killing you. You stop cheating on your taxes because you know the government's going to get you. See? There are two ways to get what you want, by being bad or by being good. And so sometimes with Nicodemus, do you know what you need to do? See, it's not repenting of your vices. What is it? You repent of trusting your virtues. And what do you do instead? You look to God. The God who saves you. 
So you look at Nicodemus, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and Nicodemus says, you're my teacher. And Jesus says, no, I'm not. You need to see me in a whole new way. Here's what I want you to do right now. I want, this, this, is, this is what this is like. He says this, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. He says, Nicodemus, I don't want to relate to you as your teacher. I want to relate to you like that. Do you want to know the power in your life? It's that. See, look, Nicodemus. Look at the Son of Man lifted up. Don't you see that's a technical term? Don't you see that? Nicodemus would understood this, stood this right away. This is, this is, not, this is a technical term. With Rome. This is what Rome would do. We don't, we don't do this anymore, but this is what Rome would do. Rome would do capital punishment. How would they do it? They would, they, it was cruel and it was barbaric, and what they would do is they would lift people up, and they did that in public. They lifted them up because they wanted everybody to see. Look, people, we're going to do that to you if you don't behave. And they lifted him up in front of the entire world. That's a technical term. Do you know when this became visceral for me? There's a movie that came out a while ago but now, but it's called The Passion of the Christ. That's when it became visceral for me because we don't go around seeing crosses outside our city gates. But it became visceral for me when all, it's, this is one, it's, I remember this so specifically. I'm watching the movie. This was the one part of the movie. It's depicting the passion of the Christ. This is the one part of the movie I couldn't watch. I couldn't watch. When they had the cross laid on the ground and all of a sudden you hear, tink! And the agony and the pain, the cry, I couldn't watch. This is a technical term. Do you want to know me? Do you want your heart unlocked? Do you want to understand? Do you want to experience the kingdom of God? Nicodemus, look. 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 Look, church. Maybe somebody came in here today and you weren't a Christian yet. It's possible. Look. Maybe you came in here and you already were a war. You want to grow. Look. You want your hope to grow. You want your peace to grow. Look. Look. Yes, God gives the new birth. Yes, God is the one who does it. He's telling you how he does. Look. Look. Do you want more faith? Look. There is so much forgiveness for you there. Do you want more hope? Look. What won't God do for you? He did that. Look. Do you want more love? Do you want more love? Look. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have, right now, have eternal life. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. Uh, When the sight of you, the Son of Man lifted up, is a sight of so much joy and peace and love. I ask that you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts even more, Lord, to give us a birth, a deepening birth 
a growing conviction. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please stand. Uh, we're going to confess our faith this morning using uh, Lent and confession of faith. This is what the Bible teaches and therefore what we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ. He is the true God from all eternity, almighty, all-knowing, present in all places. He is a man from Nazareth, weak in the flesh, fearful of future sorrow, tortured by pain. He was tempted like us, yet like we will never know. But he triumphed over temptation. He refrained from his full might and glory. He submitted humbly to the Father's will. He chose death to give us life. We believe that our sins anger God, each one of them, big and small, public and private, those that hurt others, those that don't appear to hurt anyone, those we don't even remember. We believe that Jesus lived and died for the sins of the world. He resisted every temptation. He reached out in love to anyone in need. He remained pure in every thought, not just to be a good person, not just to be a good example, but to be mankind's perfect savior and substitute, to live the law in our place, so that the law will not condemn us. He submitted to shame. He suffered unjust punishment. He sacrificed himself, not to prove a point, not just to show us how to obey, but to take mankind's sentence for sin as our perfect savior and substitute. He is our sure hope and salvation. This is what the Bible says. Therefore, this is what we believe. Please be seated. At this time, the offering plates will come around. And I want to invite you to consider taking that worship register. It's, it's maroon. Um, and writing your name down, especially if you're a guest here with us. If you want to receive a once-a-week email from St. Mark, put down your email address. If you'd like a contact from me, you can put down um, your phone number. I'd be happy to reach out to you. Church, please stand for prayer. We are God's children, and, and we get to come to him and uh, pray for others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your Son 
has shown your love to the world in his death and resurrection. Give your people hearts to remember your gracious works and to proclaim your name in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you promise us an inheritance not because of your law, but because of your promise to Abraham and to us. In your grace, nourish us in the faith unto life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you made your servant Abraham the father of us all through faith. And you have given all fathers the calling of Abraham to hand down the gospel of Christ. Fill their hearts with the words of Christ and remember them according to your great mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty God, remember our nation and its leaders. Bless all who make administer and judge our laws and enable us to be good and responsible citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, be near to the sick and the suffering. Comfort them with your divine promises and grant healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, Nicodemus was led by the word of Jesus to the cross, and from the cross he received the body of Jesus. Grant us faith like his to trust your word and receive Christ through faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, you give life to the dead, and you've united the faithful of all ages in the body of Christ. As you shelter all the saints in the arms of your mercy, so comfort us who await your final victory over death in the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We'll join singing our closing song.
All right. Uh, just I just have a couple um, announcements, and then our ministry coordinators got a couple announcements as well. Um, the first one is uh, this Wednesday. Just keep in mind, this Wednesday you're all still invited to come to um, Lenten services. There'll be it's at 6:30 p.m. If you want to come for dinner, there's dinner at 5 p.m. The church council is serving pulled pork sandwiches, so that's this Wednesday. Uh, and then downstairs, we've got more going on today, this morning. If you want to come downstairs for, uh, to the lower level, you just kind of head to the right and you'll find it. Uh, come on down. Uh, we're going to be having some more teaching on having joyful spiritual conversations with people, uh, whether they're Christians or not. And uh, Sunday school is going to be going on at the same time and meeting down there as well. Uh, peace and joy to you on this wonderful Sunday. Hi, um, is this on? I think it is. Okay. I'm Molly. I'm the ministry coordinator here at St. Mark Lutheran. Um, so a couple of things I mentioned last week that we're doing a door drive where we're going to be hanging up door hangers around the West Mankato community here. Um, that is not going to be requiring anybody to talk. So if you're like me and maybe not a huge fan of talking to hundreds of people, um, then that will be a great opportunity for you to help serve our church. So we're going to be meeting here at 9.30, walking around, we'll make sure we get people paired up and with a route, and then we'll be hanging those on doors in the neighborhood. Um, so please sign up for that because afterwards we will have a lunch. And then secondly, we are starting our member directory because our church is growing and so we wanna get to know our new faces, our familiar faces. So if your last name is A through J, please meet me and Jenna up here. We'll get your picture. Um, any information that will be in that, we'll make sure we check with you before we share it, but it will only stay within our church. So only our members will have access to it. We won't be like posting it online or anything. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you. 